morning, everybody. Thank you for coming out on a slightly gloomy uh, Washington morning. Um, but it's great to see you all here. And um, it's particularly great to have Air Marshal Davies, Chief of the Royal Australian Air Force, with us this morning. Uh, before we get started, I'm obliged to make a safety announcement, and that is to say that in the event of uh, an emergency, and I'm pretty confident there won't be one, uh, we've got two ways of getting out of the building, depending on where the threat is. Uh, we can either go out the doors that you entered uh, and head out onto the street and down towards St Matthew, St Matthew's Cathedral, down Rhode Island Avenue, or else out the, uh, the exit at the back. Uh, and the marshalling point for that, uh, that exit is the National Geographic. Um, as I said, it's great to welcome Air Marshal Leo Davies here this morning. He's going to address us on his plan to develop the Royal Australian Air Force as a fifth generation Air Force. And in particular, as this uh, event is part of our uh, alliances and American leadership project, I'm delighted that um, uh, Air Marshal Davies is going to talk about uh, the Royal Australian Air Force in the context of the US alliance and also Australia's other partnerships. Uh, I'm also uh, very pleased that my friend and colleague, Kath Hicks, uh, uh, the um, head of the International Security Program here at CSIS is with us. And I'll say a bit more about Kath later. I think um, it's pretty widely acknowledged that when it comes to Australia's services, really the Royal Australian Air Force has set a benchmark in terms of having a clear vision about how it wants to organise and equip and fight in the 21st century and also for having a concrete plan for getting there. The Royal Australian Air Force has a long history of being right at the cutting edge. It's probably not that widely known, and Leo, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the Royal Australian Air Force is the second oldest air force in the world. Um, so there's a lot of history there. And when it comes to interoperability with the United States, uh, the relationship is almost as old as that. Uh, after the fall of the Philippines in the Second World War, much of the US Air Force in the Pacific moved to northern Australia and commenced operations from there. And they fought incredibly closely with uh, the Australian Air Force in Papua New Guinea and other uh, parts of the South Pacific campaign. So that history of interoperability is very deep indeed. And today, there's a historical echo of that when you look at the increasing US Air Force rotations through uh, the air bases around northern Australia as part of the US Force Posture Initiative um, announced a few years ago. And of course, we're also working very closely together uh, in the skies over Iraq and Syria in the campaign against ISIL. Um, Air Marshal Davies probably won't boast uh, too much about his Air Force, but I have the luxury of being able to do that today. Uh, as someone who was involved in the decision-making to send the Air Force uh, to participate in that campaign, I was incredibly impressed with the speed with which the RAF was able to prepare and deploy a very potent and very versatile air task group to the Middle East without fuss and with absolutely no outside assistance. And I think that's the first time Australia had been able to do that for, for some decades. So it was a very considerable achievement. Uh, it's a force of FA-18s, um, at times classics and at times super hornets, uh, an E-7A wedge tail airborne early warning control aircraft, a KC-30 refuelling aircraft, and they've been supported by C-130Js and C-17s in all manner of tasks. And that Australian Air Task Group really has been involved in just about every aspect of the campaign, uh, everything from humanitarian airdrops through to strike missions. Uh, just to give you a few numbers, there have been more than 2,000 Australian Hornet sorties. Uh, they've dropped nearly 2,000 munitions and notched up almost 18,000 flying hours. Uh, there have been nearly 1,000 KC-30 missions. They've delivered 35,000 tonnes or more of fuel to coalition aircraft, including from the US, the UK, the United Arab Emirates, Saudi Arabia, France and Canada. And there have been nearly 350 E-7A missions and those aircraft have played a vital role in coordinating coalition air operations in the very crowded skies over Syria and Iraq.
So by any measure, it's been a very significant contribution. I think one which perhaps is underrated, uh, maybe even in this town, and really is a testament to the vision and planning uh, that's gone on inside the RAF and the level of interoperability that the RAF has deliberately strived for with the United States. Uh, Air Marshal Davies has played a really key role in all of this. Uh, he flew P3s and F-111s. Uh, he knows this country very well. He had a stint on exchange with the US Air Force at Cannon Air Force Base in New Mexico. Uh, he worked at the Combined Air Operations Centre in the Middle East very important role, of course, and he was air attaché uh, across the road uh, at the embassy. And for all those, um, for all that service, he's been awarded the US Legion of Merit. So that tells you something about hi how highly he's regarded in this town. He's held a series of senior capability development and planning roles, so his fingerprints are on a lot of this. Uh, and he's been, in another perhaps American connection, he's been Chief of Air Force since July 4th, 2015. Uh, so today I'm going to ask uh, Leo to come up and address everyone, then we're going to um, switch to a panel format. I'm going to ask Kath to make a few comments. Uh, we'll have a, a moderated discussion and then we'll take some aud uh, audience questions and we're going to wrap up at about 10 o'clock. So thank you very much again for coming and thank you, Leo. Thanks very much, uh, Andrew. Kathy, thanks very much for the uh, opportunity. Uh, it, it truly is, ladies and gentlemen, a great privilege to be here uh, to talk with you today about a topic that really is most vital uh, in my role uh, as an Air Chief. That's the development of our future force in the context of our strategic alliances. Specifically, I'll discuss today the development and sustainment of Australia's fifth generation Air Force, what that means for the Australian Defence Force, and what it may mean for our most significant ally, the United States. I'll also examine the implications of this force for our engagement with our regional allies and our partners. Now, we believe we coined the term fifth generation Air Force in our recently released Air Force strategy. We defined the concept as a fully networked and integrated Air Force that exploits the combat multiplier effects of a readily available, integrated and shared battle space picture to deliver lethal and non-lethal air power for joint Australian Defence Force allied and coalition operations. We aim to be the first fully fifth generation force. By 2025, we will possess no legacy platforms. Our oldest aircraft will be our J model C-130 Hercules. Such sweeping transformation naturally provides us with tremendous opportunities, but does of course pose a few challenges. Our most immediate challenge highlights integration within the ADF, and in particular, our earlier generation systems. Equally, we must examine how Air Force will operate with our principal ally, the United States. And finally, we need to understand how we'll function at a force level, with regional partners still developing their force structure, and the countries who do not possess the generational capabilities of Australian or American forces. This is a complex matrix. The solution lies not just in coining a phrase, but in developing a strategy to set our organisation on a different footing. Our Air Force strategy contains five vectors for organisational change. The first of these is joint warfighting. It describes how Air Force will operate as part of the Australian Defence Force, with our allies and in coalition operations. In terms of opportunities, the Royal Australian Air Force's fighting elements will largely comprise systems common to the United States Navy and United States Air Force. Our Joint Strike Fighter, the first 72 of which will be A models, will be in service with the United States Air Force. This presents obvious options for collaboration. The remainder of our combat force, that's our Poseidons, our Tritons, our Super Hornets and Growlers, they'll match the capability set of the United States Navy. Therefore, our Air Force sits in a compelling position, straddling different force elements of our greatest ally and strategic partner. Our modern Air Force offers the potential to explore how we can operate together in a maritime environment supported by sea and land capabilities. I'll return to the significance of this in a moment. But first, how do we get here? 
Australia's current, and more importantly, our future force structure, has come about in large part because of our enduring relationship with the United States. Indeed, our development of a fifth generation Air Force has been fostered by paying very close attention to the relationships at all levels and with all the US services and over a number of decades. A famous Australian general, Sir John Monash, who commanded both Australian and US forces in World War I, on witnessing Australian airmen protecting American and Australian soldiers on the Western Front, described those primal combat operations as the perfection of teamwork. His comment stands as an enduring reminder that our alliance is about more than shared interests. It is about friendships, it's about close associations that develop with the test of combat, with a vision of common strategic purpose. A century later, our wedge tails, hornets and tankers operating in the skies over Iraq and Syria affirm these bonds. They belong to a committed, high-tech ally seeking actively to partner and to do more in the cause of common strategic interests. One description of this relationship would be institutional interoperability. Another is friendship, or as we say in Australia, mateship. Either way, I consider these relationships as the bedrock of an effective security and military posture. They are the intangibles that breathe life into the collective security arrangements such as ANZUS, and the reason I can sincerely call many people in this town my friend. Ultimately, whether through friendship or institutional arrangement, our combined joint capability now means we can prosecute our shared interests together more decisively, and where necessary, we possess the means to do so more forcefully. In Australia, the imminent arrival of the Joint Strike Fighter has crystallised a developing debate between our three services. It has forced us to think about network capabilities that will integrate with Army, Navy and Air Force from design through to operational delivery. This aircraft has redefined joint. JSF also means that with the US, we are more than just friends and allies. We are technology partners whose capability brings us shared futures. Fifth generation systems were conceived with that purpose in mind from the very outset. When people ask me what a fifth generation Air Force is, I could tell them it means a fully networked and integrated Air Force whose systems share battle space awareness from multiple nodes to increase situational awareness, targeting fidelity and to maximise whole of force effects. Instead, I employ the metaphor of a formation, a foreship of JSFs, an Australian, a Marine Corps, United States Air Force and a United States Navy jet, an airborne team of teams. Our four pilots draw from common intelligence mission data, they draw from common threat libraries, from common target acceptance and validation. They are supported by network nationally agnostic command and control systems and electronic warfare assets. They accept airborne early warning and control systems, air to air refueling, all drawn from a common combined force. They have trained together. Indeed, many of them have fought together. Even our logistic support is common. Parts and weapons can be shared as readily as data and as quickly as our technicians can fit them. Software and hardware combine to make this team one of the most lethal and versatile air combat capabilities available to allied and coalition forces. Joint Strike Fighter allows us to envisage the interoperability not only of Australian and US forces, but other regional and allied JSF operators. This ability to be an integrator is why the JSF is a catalyst for fifth generation combat. We have started to explore what this means in Australia at a whole of force level. And I invite the United States Air Force and the United States Navy to join and expand on this conversation. I do this knowing that for an Australian chief to extend such an invitation is to step into your backyard. But it's also our backyard. And I know that your successful integration as a force multiplier for our shared objectives. Together we can realise the full potential of fifth generation capability more quickly. 
we must accelerate meaningful conversations between all our services, our armies, air forces and navies, on the future of joint force integration at an alliance level. In some respects, our Aussie size allows us to turn just a little bit faster. I want to participate in your force design processes so we can produce scaled, high-end systems for a medium power like Australia. Our aim is that our forces and others can operate seamlessly alongside yours. Shared design acknowledges that fifth generation is not just about specific platforms, such as the JSF. It is about a whole of force level concept and capabilities that dramatically change the way we engage within any battle space. We in Australia are starting to explore the strategic implications of these shifts in our national force posture. We want to explore them with you. So what does this mean for Australia in a regional context? Our geography, coupled with our unique relationships, make our fifth generation Air Force a game changer for regional stability. Australia's defence objectives have, at their core, a requirement to encourage regional states' participation in the rules-based global order. Defence white papers from 2009, 13 and 2016 are consistent in advocating this policy. We reflect it in our defence posture. A rules-based global order is our strongest preference and we are working with our regional partners to bring it about. Self-evidently, our geography has always driven our engagement in the militaries of the Southwest Pacific and Southeast Asia. We will continue to explore how to work with regional partners, despite the misalignments that occur in technology, concepts and cultures between countries. I have first-hand experience of that in a practical sense. As a young navigator, I flew P3 Orion missions out of Malaysia on what is known as Operation Gateway. Begun in 1980 to provide counter piracy and maritime security, Gateway continues today because our interests and those of Malaysia remain constant as we protect the sea lanes. I reflected then that Australia's active security cooperation with partners like Malaysia generated steel threads, threads that bridged oceans. Those threads went beyond both countries. Cooperating with US forces was an ever-present factor in those operations, and there was a regional dividend of transparency and peace. As often happens, multiple partners underwrote security outcomes, albeit with different levels of capability. Our fifth generation Air Force will expand those opportunities. For example, our P-8 Poseidons, whose sophisticated integrated sensors and data at a highly classified level, yet will continue to operate from Malaysian bases. Traditionally, air riders from other nations have uh, accompanied our gateway patrols. This has served as training and relationship building and exposure in Australia's nearest region. Our Poseidons will continue to carry air riders. Our engagement won't abate due to fifth generation technology. It will evolve. We will balance our important relationships with a need to maintain the integrity of our data and security systems. And in doing so, we will induct our region into the rules-based global order, whilst we use our fifth generation capabilities to defend it. Our Air Force can and should be a strategic technology bridge to our neighbours. Despite the urgency of geography, relationships matter. Some relationships in some locations more than others. Nowhere is this more obvious than in the space and cyber domains. We in Australia see parts of the sky that you in the US cannot. Equally, countries such as Japan and Singapore are defined by geographies which drive their regional choices. We therefore have a confluence of commercial capabilities and geography which, if focused, could be strong assets in a mutual development of space and cyber systems. Space and cyber are critical to the air domain. They will be increasingly contested and congested, and we in the US, Australia and our partners will have to maintain superiority in those domains to prevail. <coughs> Excuse me. 
It is our unique relationship with regional players, relationships which US may not enjoy, that allows us in Australia to play a special role here. We have, if you will, the insight of a permanent resident. Our relationship with countries like India and Indonesia, to whom you in the US seek greater access, are perhaps a case in point. Both countries are emergent powers and emergent economies as space and cyber rise to prominence in warfare. A key alliance objective should therefore be for us to harness regional partners in the development of key technologies like space and cyber to guarantee increased participation in and shore up the notion of the rules-based global order and to defend it with leading edge capability. Such a future will take brokering. It will require consideration and trust but it will be necessary in tilting the balance of regional interests in our favour, and it will shape the future of the air domain. I should finally touch upon another key tenant of our vision for a fifth generation future. Successive Australian governments have told us that we must continue to earn our place in the region. We cannot become complacent and assume that our previous success will secure us. Our Minister for Defence emphasised Australia's leadership role with respect to smaller regional partners such as Timor-Lese, Papua New Guinea and the Pacific Island nations with the release of the Defence White Paper last year. The Australian Foreign Minister stated in Singapore in March this year that one reason why the rules-based order underwrites stability despite shifts in power and wealth is that such an order does not privilege previous winners nor constrain opportunities for newcomers. Our Prime Minister cemented that theme in India recently when he observed that like-minded liberal democracies can work closely to champion international law and ensure any threat to the rules-based global order can be peacefully resolved. Our leaders remind us that as military forces, we must earn our right to continue in the regional security roles to which we've been accustomed since the end of World War II. We not only have to pull our weight in the conventional military sense, we must also act as ambassadors for the rules-based global order we want our region to foster. Freedom of overflight and navigation, for example, symbolise what our regional partners expect of our vision for the future. Fifth generation capabilities, born of a values-based alliance, go beyond that. They are a living example of what strong strategic relationships founded in history and developed with trust over time, can produce. Australia and the US are now in a strong position as fifth generation technology partners to shape a discussion about the alignment between capability and values. This might well be pivotal for the ongoing development of a rules-based global order. Ladies and gentlemen, it has been a privilege to address you today and thank you again to Andrew and Cathy and CSIS for allowing me to speak. Now it is possible that you heard me outline four key themes. Australia's fifth generation Air Force is a game changer for the Australian Defence Force and by extension our regional partners. We now want to work with you in force design to generate those advanced and complex systems which can be scaled for all levels of security. In attempting to change the game we want to work to a single line of effort with all US services to shape our region in ways that reflect our global preferences. And finally, fifth generation Air Force can and should be a bridge for regional and global engagement. Let us make fifth generation an axis of, new, of a new security paradigm. President Eisenhower reminds us that the history of free people is written by their choices. I am reminded standing here of how consistent our choices as allied services and nations has been. Choices for freedom, choices for friendship, and choices for increased capability which enhances our shared security. I look forward to continued growth with the United States, with our allies and our partners in and beyond the Air Force as we develop a global future guaranteed by strength and endurance of our strategic partnerships. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much.
Well, thanks, Leo, for a terrific talk. Um, and now uh, I'd like to uh, formally introduce Kath Hicks. Uh, Kath's Senior Vice President and the Henry A. Kissinger Chair here at CSIS and Director, of course, <coughs> of the International Security Program. She was previously uh, Principal Deputy Under Secretary for Policy in the Department of Defence and also Deputy Under Secretary of Defence for, for Strategy Plans and Forces. She brings an absolute wealth of uh, experience and knowledge. She's worked on QDRs and all sorts of guidelines and um, it's great to have you with us, Kath. Thank you. Great. Thank you for inviting me. So uh, I thought what I might do um, just to build on what the Air Marshal laid out is sort of step back, particularly from an, an, an American perspective in the times I think our domestic audience is living in, um, to talk a little bit about the context in which this is, this is important, everything, why everything you laid out is so important. Um, you know, the, the U.S.-Australia alliance is incredibly steadfast, and America has done well, if you will, in, in, in the alliance, both in terms of our ability to operate together, as you point out, in World War II, the, the ability to use um, Australian land and air space um, to operate from, and of course, moving to today, to the out-of-area operations beyond the Pacific, but also in terms of the incredible set of challenges that face us together in the Pacific. And those range everywhere from piracy issues to general maritime domain awareness um, concerns to, of course, the importance of the region economically and security-wise. It's got the fastest growing economies, 60% uh, roughly of, of um, the population of the world is living in Asia. Half of the world's commerce is moving through the waterways of Asia. Um, the United States has enduring interests in the alliance with Australia. It's not just an interest, but is also a way for securing those interests. Um, so what you've laid out here, Air Marshal, really does give us strategic value in the alliance. It gives operational value, and frankly, it also gives defense trade value on both sides. Um, and that's something that's incredibly important to the U.S. I like that you framed it very much in terms of that, that sort of that values base, which is I think sometimes we have a, a little bit of a false dichotomy we draw in this country between values and interests. Um, and it is an interest for us uh, to make sure in the long run that there's a rule-based order in which countries uh, like the United States, like Australia, can pursue their economic interests, can, can pursue trade, and um, can protect their citizens. And so those values are very interest-based for us in the, long, in the long term. We at CSIS have likewise been very interested in this area. The United States has long um, understood the importance of allies and partners. We, several years ago, starting in roughly 2014 or maybe late 2013, had launched what we call a Federated Defense Project, which helped us to assess and make recommendations on concrete ways for the United States and its partners and allies to share defense and integrate defense capabilities in support of shared interests and shared values. And so what you've laid out here very much fits into that um, tradition that we have here that Andrew Shearer's project on alliances is also focused on. Um, we have more work to do in the United States uh, for all the reasons I've just laid out in terms of making that case, but even more concretely in terms of operationalizing it, in terms of how we operate with our allies, the degree to which we are thinking ahead on interoperability, um, on uh, uh, shared mission space, on how to integrate capabilities, how to think more clearly about the um, domains, uh, space, cyber, uh, that are so ubiquitous and yet require the United States to have shared intelligence arrangements and shared capability uh, systems in order to make best use of those domains. Um, also, we focus very much, I think, now in this coming, we have been and we'll be thinking ahead in the coming year or so about areas like export control reform, foreign military sales systems, um, issues of sort of nationality of supply chain and how the integrated international supply chain and defense, the security of that supply chain have to be able to work together in a much more globalized environment. So I just want to thank you for coming to CSIS to lay out your thoughts. I think they very much meet with how we've thought about it at the center, but more broadly, how I think the American national security community has long um, valued the Australia Alliance, both for its shared um, interests and capabilities and for the shared burden, frankly, that you, that you um, have committed to. Thank you. Thanks, Kath. I, I might 
put the first question in a way to both of you, I think, and that is, um, this is a very positive story, um, I think, and, and, you know, reflects to the credit, really, of both countries and, and um, their, their armed services. I just want to sort of probe a little bit, though, um, uh, and to ask, are there any sort of grey clouds on the horizon here in this story? You know, are there constraints that, that either of you can see uh, in terms of, I mean, I really liked some of the terms that, that Leo used, institutional interoperability, uh, technology partners. I mean, are there, are there limits, are there constraints, are there problems that we can foresee coming up that need to be resolved or headed off? Um, because no relationship is perfect, obviously, and there's always, um, there are always issues to be managed. What, what do they look like from, from your point of view, Leo, and Kath, perhaps from the, from the US mm -hmm. end? Like well, I'll start at the very broad level. I think the fact that the United States has trouble itself art to articulating to itself what exactly its approach on China is um, creates, you know, problems. But then also the United States with its Asian allies and Australia is an obvious example. You know, we, we have to have a shared understanding of how we think about China in particular within the um, issue set of Pacific security. And so I think that, you know, that's something that we work through continually and I think, you know, from a U.S. perspective, the degree to which we make clear that we view our role as a stabilizing role, that it's not seeking to incite, escalate conflicts with China, but that we see the value of having China join the international community as a full, um, full member with all the sort of rights but also responsibilities that come with that um, is so important to us. And then I do think at the more, if you will, technical level, I mentioned intelligence, there are other areas where um, you know, there's always more that we can do together, both at the nation to nation level but also at the defense trade level. Uh, Andrew, my, my response uh, is perhaps uh, best described uh, around the same philosophy that we built uh, the F-35. Uh, the reason that it is a fifth generation fighter is because it was conceived, designed and built as a low observable fifth generation. Uh, not its, its architecture uh, t tells us that it will manage information uh, and uh, distribute that information as part of its DNA. This institutional interoperability that I speak of uh, is exactly that. Instead of a <coughs> discovery of what we own, uh, what options we bring uh, after the fact and then try and make them fit together, which has at times been our most difficult process. Uh, if we start with interoperability as the key, as the piece in the middle that you build the rest from, interoperability naturally evolves and I am not uh, at all advocating that there is total transparency and no relevance to sovereignty. That is not what I mean. What I mean is that we respect sovereignty, that we understand those pieces we need to be able to contribute together. And uh, in that regard, that appreciation as it grows and evolves uh, makes the outcome much simpler. And just to to open the aperture a little, um, another of the, I thought, really um, good terms you had in the, the speech was this concept of, um, of uh, the RAF acting as a, a strategic technology bridge to some of Australia's regional neighbours. Mm. Um, could you expand a bit on that, particularly, I guess, with regard to Japan, um, which has a growing strategic partnership with Australia? What's your sort of vision for for how you think about working with the Japanese Self-Defence Force, for example, and are there others that you sort of place particular weight and priority on in the region? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure I'd use the term priority, but uh, a sequence that's based on maturity levels is, is where I see uh, our relationship uh, with regional nations. And uh, whilst there is a fair amount of ocean between Australia and Japan, uh, I still regard them as, as a uh, close regional neighbour. Uh, and that is uh, perhaps best uh, seen in terms of the Australian US, and if I could be narrow for a second, the Royal Australian Air Force and the United States Air Force, if I was to cast our relationship back about even 10 years, which isn't that long ago, we were beginning to build our uh, own 
trust, our own appreciation of what we would like to be able to use with the United States Air Force. Uh, our security levels have grown. Uh, our ability to do more has grown. Uh, I throw that forward now. Uh, probably the most uh, advanced uh, sharing of, uh, it in a modern combat uh, effect, air power effect, is with Singapore. Mm -hmm. uh, it certainly is with uh, New Zealand. Uh, as that evolves then, uh, Japan uh, is one of those nations that would be uh, further along the maturity stake. I think when I talk uh, uh, to uh, General Sugiyama, there is a, uh, a mutual recognition that we are both on the same path and that if we were to share that path uh, and share it I I even in a trilateral sense with the United States, uh, we can learn faster. And I, I mentioned that in my words. I, uh, there is no doubt in my mind we can go faster together than we can on our own. And uh, again, perhaps for both of you, but, but space and cyber, you rightly um, highlighted as, as, as a real key mm. um, to, to so much. Could you expand a little on what further scope you both see um, uh, for Australia and the US to start with, um, to work together in those domains, but also building out perhaps to some of these other partners, Japan, Singapore, which again you touched on in your speech. I think there's a, a very real appreciation that uh, when we speak in the cyber domain, it's not just about uh, the movement of data or ones and zeros uh, around a particular uh, communications node. It's about knowing where that data came from, with what fidelity it is owned, uh, and with whom you can share it. Uh, in that context, then, uh, we talk about having uh, an ability to operate with full knowledge that the system we are using is indeed valid. Uh, and I know there are, there are lots of conversations around uh, hacking and the like, uh, a very simple term from a uh, not a very technical uh, gentleman. But the, 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 the thought here is about uh, resilience and our ability to do our job knowing that, and I'll use the, the picture that's in my mind, is one of do we know that the part we're about to fit to that aircraft is the right part and that it came with all the valid uh, logistical uh, train? Uh, where, where did it come from? From which country should be irrelevant if we know that it is the right part? It's that intimacy, if you like, in, uh, in, in, a, in a cyber domain that uh, I'm quite interested in. Uh, space, for me, if we went back to, I know a little dramatic, but if we went back to the Wright brothers or we went back to uh, the jet engine and we went back to uh, Korea and missiles, uh, each of those steps brought us a significant way forward in the way we would uh, be able to apply air power. Uh, if we don't harness the space domain, both from a knowledge of what is in space and what might uh, be in space in the near future and have uh, our ability to use it at our discretion, uh, it, it would be like going backwards. Uh, and uh, I think that's not well understood by um, too many people. Yeah, I'm going to answer slightly off of the way you framed it, only due to the lack of my, my knowledge of exactly where the US-Australia alliance is on both of those issues. But to say that I, I think very much highlighted in the remarks made today, you know, the, the movement to a fifth generation Air Force um, itself is a huge advancement on, if you will, space and sire. You, you, you aren't just investing in platforms, you are investing in networks. Um, and that's also how the US thinks about um, its air capabilities, not just as a series of, for instance, strike platforms or reconnaissance platforms, but part of a netted system that includes cyber and space capabilities that you can, you can maximize your advantage in. So I think that the degree to which we can exercise together those capabilities, we can think about the operational concepts that make most sense um, with those capabilities and very much so thinking about it in this integrated domain way of including space and cyber as key pieces, of course, the core of that networking capability that the platforms are helping to bring to bear. I think that's, uh, that creates incredible opportunity within the alliance and also for, the, for us as allies to work with others in the region. 
Thanks, Kath. I, I am going to open it up, but I just, I just want to ask one more question um, of Leo, and that is around um, the growing missile threat in the Asia-Pacific region in particular. And um, it, it, it seems to me that while Australia has historically enjoyed a lot of strategic depth, that that is being eroded. And perhaps um, a more dramatic word is needed than eroded because some of the, some of the um, development in this area is happening really quickly and I, it seems to me it often is happening faster than our analysts anticipate. How is Australia thinking about um, integrated air and missile defence in this new world of everything from sort of hypersonic cruise missiles through to ICBMs mm. and, and, and missiles that can potentially reach Australia and, and the US. How, how are we thinking about that and, and positioning for that future, which could be um, on us sooner than many people think? Yeah. Uh, thanks, Andrew. Earlier white papers uh, were hinting towards uh, the need to be resilient in terms of uh, a long-range strike, no matter what, uh, what delivery method was, was available. Uh, 2016 white paper made that quite, quite clear that an integrated air and missile defence was a necessary part of, uh, of an ADF uh, future and, and part of our ORBAT uh, order of battle. Uh, in there though, I, I think there is a, uh, a need to understand that uh, this is not something that uh, was discovered yesterday uh, and will be on us tomorrow. Uh, like most things in a uh, military context, uh, it, it's been an evolution. Uh, we, we went from uh, sharp sticks and stones through, through bows and arrows and black powder to rifle to, uh, and, and this is, uh, in many respects, yet another part of that evolution, and, and we will have a, an offensive and then a counter or a defensive uh, uh, approach to that. What, what, uh, what I'm seeing that I, I really like about the, uh, the Australian government and our ADF response to that is that it's not, and, and it might simplistically be seen as, but it should not be seen as a, a, a way to develop something on a truck or trailer that you park in a particular location and it's a kinetic response to a kinetic uh, attack. Uh, the approach is one of an integrated, and I, I think the uh, I in IAMD is, is the most significant piece here. Uh, we've had recent announcements for <coughs> Project, <coughs> excuse me, 197 Land 197 Bravo, which is the short range uh, uh, defence aspect. But beyond that, the, the first part of Air 6500, uh, which is the Integrated Air and Missile Defence Project for the ADF, the very first phase of that is the architecture, it is the command and control, it is the system that we will bolt all of the elements of the ADF and our coalition partners into. I'm very keen to explore with the United States Navy, with the United States Air Force, with uh, regional partners, with Singapore, with, uh, with our European partners about if we own this architecture, how do we plug it all in? In my view, uh, an air warfare destroyer has just as much to play in here as some sort of uh, land-based uh, missile system. Uh, it, it's the interconnectivity, if you like, of the entire architecture that's more important at this point than, the, if I could use simple term, the whoosh bang. Terrific, thank you. I'm gonna open it up to questions. Please wait for the microphone and also state your name and affiliation. Down the front here. Uh, Colin Clark, Breaking Defense. Um, the U.S. Air Force and the U.S. military generally are uh, in the early stages of hashing out exactly what multi-domain warfare will look like and how they'll respond. Uh, how is this shaping your debates? Thank you for the question. Uh, multi-domain warfare uh, would perhaps be, at first thought, uh, something that uh, a bunch of smart people could sit in a room and uh, define clearly uh, and then perhaps bring to bear next week. Uh, but it is certainly not that. Uh, we are discovering through uh, our plan Jericho, uh, through what has been a, uh, a clear change in the Australian Defence Force approach to uh, capability development, uh, and one element of that that is 
very prevalent at the moment and it is driving many of the uh, current decisions going to government uh, is forced design. When the question about uh, uh, multi-domain uh, operations uh, is asked, it is how could we as a whole of government in the first instance, but as a whole of defence in the next instance, both from within Australia if we need to operate independently or uh, regionally as we currently uh, are, if you look at the Middle East as the region, uh, we are looking at the effect we wish to have and then asking how best to achieve that. Uh, sometimes that uh, response has been difficult to get to because of uh, a traditional uh, environmental question. Chief of Air Force was asked, how would you have the effect and I'll give you an air power answer. But it might actually be that a political or diplomatic response is the more effective. Uh, that that whole, of, uh, whole of government response is really the key. Also down the front. <clears throat> Lara Seligman with Aviation Week. Um, you talked a little bit about the importance of protecting sovereign data. Um, so how do, you, how do you go about doing this in this in interoperable world, especially with F-35? I mean, key to F-35 is being able to share all the data to yep. see the same picture. So how do you get around that? Uh, it, it's, it's not as difficult as you might think. Uh, I, I still hold the view that there are some technological steps still to come. Uh, so we are at the moment able to allow uh, uh, foreign nationals to sit at a secret terminal on the Australian Defence Network and give them access to 90% of what's available on that network and not the other 10%. Uh, if, if that is a simple example of what we are able to do, uh, that is expandable. The second element uh, for me in responding to your question is one of trust uh, and proven track record and trust. Uh, I mentioned earlier about 10 years ago when the access the United States Air Force began to give to the Royal Australian Air Force. And uh, there are a number of people probably in this room who are sitting in very uh, um, privileged positions within our relationship with the United States and the Air Force in particular. Uh, and they have earned the right to sit there because they are proper in their management of information. So I think there are two pieces here. It is one of one that is exclusion from knowing and the other is proper use of knowing and you need both. And up the back. Thanks. Hi, I'm Michelle Davies. Thank you so much for speaking to us today. And thank you, Andrew and Kath, for your discussion. Uh, Brooke Wiley from the ABC. I'm wondering, uh, in the context of escalating tensions on the Korean Peninsula, and although it's fallen out of the news cycle as well, the South China Sea, what you see as the role of Australian forces uh, over the coming years, I'm asking in the context of our relationship with the United States as well, what you see the role of our forces would be. And a second question, Broadly, over the next five to ten years, what do you see as some of the most um, difficult challenges facing the RAF, whether that is uh, a threat or whether that's technology? I, I'm asking the question broadly. Okay. Thank you. In answer to your first, in answering your first question, uh, Australia does not have any sovereign uh, claim in the South China Sea or that part of the world. Uh, but we certainly have a claim to maintenance of uh, relationships and we certainly have a right to claim uh, free uh, access to trade uh, and um, if uh, you take what is one of our strategic, uh, uh, one of the most strategic parts of being an Australian is that we're in Australia and it's an island and it's a long way from anywhere which also means that we have uh, a liability then on, on uh, ships and aircraft uh, for trade. Uh, it is really that simple. Uh, it, if the evolution of uh, the South China Sea and, uh, and the region is one where we are able to freely uh, travel and trade, uh, then Australia is happy. Uh, and, and it's a pretty simple statement. Uh, in, in, uh, in my view, uh, maintenance of those relationships uh, throughout Southeast Asia all the way to, uh, to South Korea 
uh, is an important aspect uh, of that maintenance in the long term. Uh, without a foundation of, uh, of, in my case, a military to military relationship uh, with, uh, with our sister services, uh, then, then the possibility of uh, other options exist when we are uh, communicating and communicating vividly, uh, we are able to understand and I, I think that is, that is truly vital. Uh, answer to your second question uh, might surprise you. Uh, it's not a technological one. Uh, I am truly blessed to have had successive chiefs and air forces and I might add uh, successive governments who have allowed the Australian Defence Force to have a fair share of the, uh, of the budget uh, and allowed us to remain uh, both modern and, and vital. Uh, the, the, real, the real piece I think for us is going to be uh, around two parts. One of them is taking advantage of those assets and operating them in a modern context, not in a uh, already well understood context. I, I, I've said this many times, uh, it would be a possibility and a shame if we operated the F-35 the same way as we operated our Hornets. Uh, it is a totally different paradigm. We are already discovering this as our crews, our third P-8 Poseidon arrived in Australia, uh, is airborne now on its way to Australia. When I talk to the crews, they are talking in such excited terms about what they can do with, with this aircraft compared to what they could do with our P-3 uh, and, and that excites them. Brings me around to my second part of the second question, if you like. Uh, the real issue, the, the one that I get asked often, what keeps me awake at night? Nothing. What do I wake up thinking about first in the morning? How do we recruit, attract and retain the workforce that is going to fight with those aircraft? And I think it's a very different uh, set of circumstances for those young people who are considering knocking on the Royal Australian Air Force door and I would extend that to the Australian Defence Force. I think Army and Navy have very similar uh, aspirations for the same cadre of people. Uh, if we're not careful, we won't get that cadre and we'll fall short uh, people. That's my concern. Uh, sir, up the back. Liberal Voice America. Um, in this room, you have uh, Australian airmen that scatter the throughout the United States uh, for exchange programs. But our United States military commanders have said that when money is tight, they would, they would cut these programs, exchange programs. Have you seen any, any real impact in terms of US, in United States and Australian uh, military uh, exchange program? Uh, uh, any cut of that due to the United States' uh, military funding issue? Thank you. Thank you for the question. Uh, have I seen a change? My, my binary answer is no. What I've seen is a shift in the prioritization. Uh, I've seen this over quite a number of years. Uh, I, I do not lay that directly at the feet of a budget uh, pressure, but more around uh, a strategic need. Uh, as, as our aircraft systems and our technologies change, I've seen the shape of the exchanges uh, shift, and quite rightly. Uh, at, at times, uh, I've seen successive Chiefs of Staff, United States Air Force, and Chiefs uh, of Royal Australian Air Force have that uh, uh, consideration of, if I only have 20 exchanges, which 20 do I choose? Uh, that has changed shape. But uh, I would be comfortable in saying to you that the size and the impact of those exchanges has not changed in 20 years. And uh, there's time, I think, for one more question, uh, if we have one. Um, if there aren't any from the audience, I might ask a, a sort of wrap-up question to both of you. And perhaps starting with Kath, um, with the new administration here in the US, there's a lot of talk about the future of the whole US rebalance and, and where that might be going. Do you have thoughts on that and the implications in particular for the sort of cooperation we're talking about with Australia and, and Leo, perhaps your perspective on that. I mean, it seems to me that, you know, at the moment we're war fighting together in the Middle East, but as the Asia Pacific becomes more congested and contested, I think it's fair to say, a lot of the focus of the alliance is actually going to shift back to the Western Pacific, which is actually the sort of ANZUS area of operations mm. after all. 
you know, your thoughts on wh what that might mean for Australia in the sort of longer term? So. Well, far be it for me to predict, first of all, anything that <laughs> might happen um, on the US side from the administration viewpoint. So putting that to the side, I would simply say, I do think the rebalances, and it, look, it's a, it's a bipartisan, essentially, viewpoint that's been carried forward across multiple administrations. Everyone has their own framing. It probably won't be called the rebalance, but the idea that, as I said before, that the basic metrics that exist in the world um, that would drive the United States to continue to see Asia as incredibly important to its economy, its security, its, um, its again, the rules-based order of the world, all of those factors remain. I think those are unassailable, and I think the administration will essentially embrace that in one way or another. That said, as I said, I don't think the framing is likely to be the same as the last administration's framing. That shouldn't surprise anyone. Um, but I do worry that the security piece, as it already was running well ahead, if you will, of a well thought through, for instance, trade policy from the United States, will continue to be the strongest piece. Um, with the diplomatic and trade pieces falling further behind. I'm all in favor of charging ahead, if you will, on the security piece. I'm a security person, that's important to me. But I don't think you can truly make the most, if you will, of what the United States needs to do with regard to Asia until you have that diplomacy and, in particular, trade, but economic elements really well lined up to the security piece. Thanks, Kath. Leo, you have the final word. Thank you. Uh, this, in many respects, uh, is is for Australia uh, to to determine. I know that sounds a little a little backward uh, around a question from uh, a U.S. administration, uh, but but I, I I have not seen from a military perspective uh, since uh, President Trump took office. I've not seen a dramatic shift, if any shift, in the way I am able to relate with General Golfin, with the way I'm able to relate to a United States Navy. There have been no no changes that I can uh, clearly identify. Uh, for me, that's uh, th that's a good sign. Uh, that that that's a uh, that that our relationship uh, at a military military level ha has not shifted, or, and I do not see anywhere near uh, anywhere on the horizon any need to shift. Uh, it, what I would maintain is that for uh, you know, for the hundred years that we've been fighting alongside the United States for for common causes. Uh, is, is an inherent US uh, awareness that to protect the nation and its interests is vital. Uh, I have not seen that uh, shift at all. If that is the case, then it's up to Australia to continue to show that we are a worthwhile partner, that we can have more to contribute. And the question I asked more broadly uh, during my words uh, was, w we think we have more to contribute than we currently do and we'd like the opportunity to do that. Uh, I've seen no change, uh, current administration, for our ability uh, to do that in coming years. Well, I think that's a great uplifting note to end a discussion very often around town at the moment. Uh, <laughs> discussions don't quite end that way. So please join me in thanking Air Marshal Davies and uh, Kath Hicks. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you.